Welcome to a Friday night edition of Navarro Live. I'm Michael Walker. I'm joined by Aaron Bastani. Aaron, how are you doing? Michael, always the better for seeing you, my dear. My dear, I like that. Keep calling me that. Um, you, you gave me a little goat emoji on Twitter earlier. I was very touched by that. But my dear, that's even closer to my heart. Um, we've got some big stories tonight. We're going to be talking about Joe Biden. He's issued an ultimatum to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Gaza. It's not for a ceasefire, unfortunately. It's just um, to let in more aid. He's talking about a ceasefire. But it's vague, as one would expect from an American president in this situation. And we'll also talk about Alan Duncan. Um, so you will have seen yesterday um, he made comments about Israeli, sorry, Freudian slip there, conservative MPs who he thinks are too close to Israel. And um, we're going to take a bit of a deep dive because Alan Duncan actually has a very long history when it comes to sparring with the Israeli state. Um, and we'll end by discussing an appearance on Sky News by Owen Jones, which has caused, uh, I have to say, very unjustified online storm. The Israeli military have released the results of their investigation into the killing of seven aid workers by drone strike on Monday evening. And they've concluded it was all a big mistake. The IDF released this statement. The investigation found that forces identified a gunman on one of the aid trucks, following which they identified an additional gunman. After the vehicles left the warehouse where their aid had been unloaded, one of the commanders mistakenly assumed that the gunmen were located inside the accompanying vehicles and that these were Hamas terrorists. The forces did not identify the vehicles in question as being associated with WCK, so that's World Central Kitchen. Following a misidentification by the forces, the forces targeted the three WCK vehicles based on the misclassification of the event and misapplication, misidentification sorry, of the vehicles as having Hamas operatives inside them, with the resulting strike leading to the deaths of seven innocent humanitarian aid workers. The strikes on the three vehicles were carried out in serious violation of the commands and IDF standard operating procedure. Two people have been dismissed from their roles um, as a result of you know, what the IDF are calling a grave mistake. Um, we think they've still got their posts in, or their roles in the Israeli army, but they've just been moved on from their specific posts. Um, it's a pretty minimal response to the death of seven aid workers. But Israel's National Security Minister Itamar ben Gavir is still not happy. So he said the chief of staff's decision to remove senior officers is the abandonment of the soldiers in the middle of a war and a grave mistake that conveys weakness. Even if there are mistakes in identification, in war soldiers are backed up and certainly not tried in a field court. To be honest, I think that is much more an accurate description of what it is normally like being an IDF soldier. You normally do um, have the, the Israeli state having your back when you kill people, whoever they are. Um, but in this case, because they happen to kill seven international citizens, citizens of Western countries, um, there have been um, some very minor consequences. Um, the minor consequences in terms of to the officers who made this mistake, obviously not minor consequences in terms of the seven people who've been killed. Um, the charity at the center of the incident has responded by saying the Israeli inquiry lacks credibility and they rejected its findings. So the World Central Kitchen have renewed their call for an independent investigation to take place into the killing of seven of their workers. And their chief executive, Erin Gore, said this, their apologies for the outrageous killing of our colleagues represent cold comfort. It's cold comfort for the victims' families and WCK's global family. Israel needs to take concrete steps to assure the safety of humanitarian aid workers. Our operations remain suspended. Now, you know, for the people of Gaza, it's that final sentence that's going to be really significant there. Our operations remain suspended. This was an organization distributing a significant amount of food in the Gaza Strip. The families of the victims will certainly not be comforted by the details of their loved ones' deaths, which sound truly dystopian, actually. This is part of Sky News' report on the IDF investigation. The World Central Kitchen teams have been delivering more than 100 tonnes of humanitarian food aid to a warehouse in Deir al-Balah. The convoy then left Deir al-Balah, driving through the deconflicted zone. The IDF said they believed Hamas fighters were in the vehicle. They also say they couldn't see the World Central Kitchen logo on the top of the car as it was nearly midnight. An IDF colonel, a major... Uh, signed off on the order to strike the first car. They now admit this was a case of mistaken identity. Two passengers are seen running from the car and entering uh, a second, and a second missile is launched, hitting the car. The IDF now say this was a grave mistake. 
Again, some passengers survive and run to a third vehicle. A third strike is launched and all seven aid workers uh, killed at this point. And the reason I say sort of dystopian is because of the, I suppose, the high tech nature of this and how, I mean, it, it is, and I think this is, I mean, we've said this before in terms of sort of IDF strategies when it comes to Gaza, sort of treating people a bit like ants, right? So you've got one car that gets struck by this drone. Some people are killed. Some people survive. The people who survive get out and make their way to a second car. That second car struck by a drone. I think the, the one or two people who survive that then move to a third car. That third car struck by a drone. You know, it's it's like something from a dystopian sci-fi novel, and because you've got you know it, it's it's this high tech killing by drones of people who have no idea where these missiles are coming from and have no means of escape wherever they go. This missile finds them. Now. As many have noted, there's only widespread attention on this particular incident because it happens to have killed citizens from Western nations. We can only presume or assume how many more incidents like this have been happening for the past six months with no complaints, no investigations, no one dismissed from their roles. The IDF never coming forward and saying, oh, a grave mistake was made because the people who were killed like ants, essentially, in those cases, were Palestinians. Um, Aaron, I mean, I don't think there are many people in the world who take IDF investigations seriously, um, especially at this point in time. Um, what do you make of this, though? Have we learned anything? Well, just to back up what you said a moment ago, I mean, this is ordering, or I presume, the norm for the IDF, which is implicit, really, in the comments of, um, it was Ben Gavir, wasn't it? In so much as we act with impunity, what on earth is going on? Why isn't our regular mode of operandi also being applied here? Well, it's not being applied here because I think it was six foreign nationals, Michael, and one Palestinian. I might be wrong. Um, it was, of course, three British nationals, a Pole, an Australian, and an American dual national. And I have to say, it's on that last individual. Obviously, the three Brits dying is more relevant to us here because we're in the UK. But Michael, you have a dual US-Canadian national amongst those dead, and the American government continues to give a $14 billion aid package to Israel, no questions asked, no strings attached. On top of that, there's now talk of an $18 billion deal involving F-15s. Um, so really, we, we, there is very little doubt, actually, that the technology used, which you just so evocatively described a moment ago, in these three strikes, it's, it's very likely to be American technology. And so you have the American government selling, giving this stuff to Israel, it's being used against their own people. I find it extraordinary. And we saw the sort of blunted, impotent reaction from Joe Biden, allegedly the most powerful person in the world, but he can't do anything about it. Um, it really does defy belief. And, and I think Ben Gavir's uh, response really gave the game away, didn't it? Um, they're angry that actually there is some accountability here. I would like to see Britain uh, do what the polls have done. The Poles have opened their own independent investigation into the killing of the Polish national. I, I would like to see the same happen with regards to the three UK nationals. I don't know how that can be executed through international law or, or bilateral treaties. I presume if there are Israeli criminals in this country, we have some kind of treaty with Israel in terms of returning them there. Um, and of course, it's different because these are Israeli nationals who've killed a British national in Israel. Um, but I, I, I think they should be. I think they should be prosecuted if possible. We absolutely should not be sending, I mean, we've, we've been saying this for weeks, of course, that we shouldn't be sending, I mean, we've been saying this for years that we shouldn't be sending Israel weapons. But it is, you know, people say it's only 1% of Israel's weapons come from the UK. That does seem to be true. Um, but it's very possible that parts in these drones did come from the UK. We don't know. Um, but parts from, from the UK have definitely killed a lot of people in this war, right? It might not be these specific seven people, as you say, six of them um, foreign nationals, one of them Palestinians, so seven aid workers, six of them um, foreigners. Um, our arms will have been used to kill many, many people in this war. Of the of the thirty three thousand people who we know have been killed so far, one can only assume that British weapons have been used. Um, let's talk about Joe Biden. The U.S. is, of course, still steadfast in its commitment to supplying the arms Israel uses to kill civilians and aid workers, including Americans. But around the edges, Biden is beginning to apply some very moderate pressure with some very moderate results. Now, following an apparently tense phone call between Biden and Netanyahu yesterday, Israel has resolved to temporarily reopen the Erez crossing to allow more aid into northern Gaza. The crossing has been closed since October. The White House said Biden called for an immediate ceasefire and threatened to condition 
political and military support for Israel unless aid to Gaza is increased. Now, of course, that threat to condition military support should have come years ago. And one might think that military support to any country at any time should be conditional, right? We shouldn't be sending, or no one, the Americans, no one should be sending weapons to people without any conditions attack, attached. Sorry, Are these weapons going to be used to repress minorities? Are they going to be used um, in, in a way which seriously breaches international humanitarian law? I, I'd have thought all aid should be conditional. Anyway, this is a new threat um, from the president, and it does represent a shift, um, which is presumably why Israel opened those crossings pretty quickly. Um, it goes without saying though, this move on crossings won't change anything fundamental, and which an Israeli spokesperson made clear, saying this, this increased aid will prevent a humanitarian crisis and is necessary to ensure the continuation of the fighting and to achieve the goals of the war. Increasing the flow of aid just to allow fighting to continue. And that's a pretty grim formulation. And as for preventing a humanitarian crisis, it's clearly too late. 33,000 Palestinians are already dead. And this morning, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a new resolution calling for Israel to be held accountable. Here's the representative for Pakistan presenting that resolution. The preamble part of the resolution expresses grave concern at the worsening situation in the occupied Palestine, especially Gaza, and the unacceptably high proportion of innocent civilian casualties. The preamble paragraphs reflect this Council's grave concern at war crimes and crimes against humanity in the OPT and the ICJ's determination that the Palestinian people under Israeli occupation face the plausible risk of genocide. They also voice our shared concern at the clear risk posed by arms transfer to Israel, which contribute to further violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, and facilitates the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity. That was a representative from Pakistan. Diplomatic tensions are especially high at the moment between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. The Gulf state has halted coordination of aid with Israel entirely. That's after their foreign minister reportedly expressed outrage at Israel's ambassador after the killing of the seven World Central Kitchen workers. Aaron, I mean, we're seeing headlines sort of about a shift in, in Biden's rhetoric. I have to say, when it comes to the Americans and also to the Arab states, everything just seems very meh, very half-hearted. You know, I think there was a hope um, by, I think, you know, in, in many ways, Hamas have completely miscalculated. Well, you know, I think the ethics of killing a bunch of civilians, I mean, we've talked about this over and over again. But I think the strategic idea was that this would make it you know, impossible for the Arab states to not respond. But these reactions are quite meh, aren't they? Sort of like, oh, we're we're breaking diplomatic ties with Israel. I think they only established diplomatic ties sort of in the last couple of years with the Abraham Accords. So, you know, you're only taking a step back a couple of years. And then with Biden, we're still going to send you weapons, but can you please let in some food so people can get can eat before you bomb them again? It's, it's all, you know, there is an idea that the narrative, because of the killing of these seven aid workers, has shifted. And I do think that is true. We are hearing sort of politicians speak in a different way about Israel than they were last week. But the practical sort of impact, that the costs which are being imposed on Israel seem minor. I think that's somewhat true. I think that's certainly true with regards to the um, Arab countries you mentioned, particularly the UAE. Uh, although, of course, these are countries which are insulated from democratic pressure. They're no, they're in no way answerable to their domestic sort of electorate. So, you know, park that for a moment. And in, in the case of the United States, you're also right. I mean, there is a conversation which is very much live about whether Donald Trump would actually be better on this than Joe Biden. And I know many people who watch and listen to this show probably think that's being flippant, frivolous. How on earth could you say that um, Trump would be better than Joe Biden? I do think there's an element of, of Trump who instinctively um, would be responding to questions of perceived national interests in a different way to Biden. I do think that. I think Biden on this issue in particular is effectively an automaton. He's thought the same thing for 40 years and he's acting in the same way. I do think if you saw, you know, a significant number of US nationals being killed in Israel or Gaza, for instance, I think Trump would respond um, in a quite distinctive way. In Britain, Michael, I think it's a bit different. You know, we've seen in the last 72 hours quite profound shifts, actually, in terms of what the establishment is saying, if not elected politicians. Um, yesterday on, on BBC Radio 4 on the Today programme, you've had the former head of MI6 agreeing with a statement put to them um, that 
there should be a shift in terms of weapons sales to uh, Israel. You've seen former senior civil servants at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office back in the day saying the same thing. You've got the sort of uh, you've got people in Rusi, you know, this this uh, defense think tank, very influential in Westminster circles. The vice chair of Rusi on Twitter saying that Britain should suspend the sales of weapons to Israel. So I would pay more attention to that than the kind of mad, frenetic tweeting of this or that conservative MP or the public statements of Joe Biden. That to me, and we're quite lucky with this in the age of social media, like I say, the vice chair of Rusi, that to me is, is more revealing of a slower shift. You know, the, the idea that the vice chair of Rusi would say that Britain should stop selling weapons to Israel was unthinkable. I mean, even, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I mean, it was entirely implausible for October 7th. The fact they're saying it now in, in March, April 2024 really, really can't be understated. And I saw a, an idiot, this man, is, I think he lives in the UK, but he's an Egyptian. He was born in Egypt. Maybe he's a UK Egyptian national now. He was born in Egypt. And he was saying that if you want to suspend sales of weapons to Israel, you're an anti-Semite. Well, if you want to, if you want, if you, if you, as somebody of Egyptian heritage, I say there's somebody of Iranian heritage, who's in the UK now, if you want to call the vice chair of Rusi, the former head of MI6, and, and some of the most senior former diplomats and civil servants in this country, if you want to call all of them anti-Semites, be my guest. Be my guest because you're going to be laughed out of town by serious people very quickly. Ignore the nonsense and the whack jobs on, on Twitter. You can see the cogs turning when it comes to the establishment in this country. The fact that three Brits were killed, and also, let's be honest, it was three former service personnel, that really counts for something. You even saw Nick Soames say this, the, I think the grandson of Churchill, say that we should suspend uh, the sale of weapons to Israel, the, the grandson of Churchill. So the idea that this is all, you know, Hamas supporting anti-Semites saying this, complete nonsense, ignore it. Something is shifting, certainly in the UK. Rishi Sunak continues to face pressure to suspend arms sales to Israel. The chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Kearns, said this on Friday morning to the BBC. I believe we have no choice but to suspend arms sales. And it's important the public understands this isn't a political decision, as some seem to want to present it as. Legal advice is advisory, so the government can choose to reject it. But UK arms export licences require a recipient to comply with international humanitarian law. And that's why emergency handbrakes, for example, exist in change of circumstances. And I think on IHL, it is important to reiterate that ministers were unable to answer when I asked in the chamber whether Israel is demonstrating a commitment to IHL. They said they had a capacity, not they were with the issue around the switching on of water and of aid deliveries. And I would point out that you had Suella Braveman on earlier this week saying that she'd seen trucks of aid going in. That is not somehow a defence that enough aid is going in. It's preposterous as a defence. The problem is the volume that is going in. Mm. I'd also reiterate something that's been overlooked is the bombing of the embassy. Diplomatic premises and diplomatic and consular staff have a special status under international law. That this is the Iranian embassy in, in, uh, in Syria. In Syria, it is indeed. And the Israelis bomb that. And we have to be very cautious because the moment we or our allies break these rules, it makes all of us vulnerable. It makes our embassies vulnerable. I think it's interesting what Alicia Kearns is saying. I mean, she she has been you know fairly reasonable on this for, for a little while now. But it seems to me that unless you are at the very top of the... Unless you're in government, essentially, or the opposition, who for some reason also think they can't say anything remotely strong, anyone who isn't a wacko is saying we should suspend arms sales to to Israel, right? So you've got the the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, you've got ex spooks, um, you've got um, you know Jack Straw now saying we should. He was the foreign secretary that took us into the Iraq War. You know these are not lefties. He's like anyone who isn't in sort of some position where they feel constrained. Now, I don't think you should feel constrained if you're in the government. I think if you're in the government, you should say, well, we actually have some impact, we have some control, so let's goddamn stop sending them the arms. But for whatever reason, they're not doing that. Anyone who seems to be able to, to, to feel they can speak freely is saying suspend them, apart from wackos like Suella Braverman, who was mentioned there. That does seem to be um, a shift. So then why isn't Rishi Sunak heeding calls to suspend those arms sales to Israel? Well, according to the I newspaper, it's because Britain is still waiting on legal advice. So they write this. Mr. Sunak and David Cameron are keeping open the option of suspending the export of UK-made weapons to Israel in the wake of the assault on an aid convoy which killed three British workers this week, multiple government sources have told I. 
the Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary are waiting for updated advice from government lawyers on whether Israel's conduct could amount to a war crime. The existing assessment cleared Benjamin Netanyahu's administration of criminality. However, it only covers the period up to the end of December, with an update covering until the end of February expected soon. The new advice is several weeks overdue, with sources suggesting that Israel's government had failed to provide timely information to investigators. Now, this is the most pathetic thing I think I've I've read all week, right? The reason the government doesn't have legal advice on whether Israel is breaching international humanitarian law is because they're waiting for Israel to give them the information, right? If, if Israel isn't giving you the information by which you can conclude whether or not they are breaking international human law, human rights law, humanitarian law, that should be enough to stop sending the arms, right? You, you, you don't say, oh, we'll, we'll keep sending you the arms until you reply to our email. Why are they going to reply to the email? Right now, I don't know if these things actually work by email, but why are they going to reply to your request for more information if the default position without that information is we're going to keep giving you the arms, right? If you were Israel in this situation and you've got information that shows you've broken international humanitarian law, right? And, and the UK government says, oh, well, if you send us that information, we might have to stop sending you weapons. But if you just ignore us, we'll keep sending you them, right? How, how does that work in terms of incentive structures, right? That, that's either sort of criminal negligence or... Um, I suppose two facedness, sort of the government saying, "Oh, you know, if they were break, if we knew they were breaking the law, we wouldn't send them." Uh, but you know, it's a difficult situation. Are, are they actively trying to get? Are they actively trying to let Israel get away with breaking international humanitarian law, or are they just completely negligent? It's one of the two. Um, Bloomberg has a different account, or a somewhat different account, of why Sunak has failed to act, citing divisions in the Conservative Party. They say that at least three cabinet ministers are opposed to any suspension of arms sales and that Sunak's weakness means he doesn't want to upset them. And they write this, Some Tory officials are concerned that a strong line against Israel could convince some MPs to support a change of leader, with pro-Israel backbenchers such as former Home Secretary and possible Sunak leadership rival Suella Braverman urging the government to maintain support for Tel Aviv. She's just visited Tel Aviv, hasn't she? So, Aaron, you've got sort of two explanations here for why we haven't suspended arms um, to, to Israel. One, um, we can't work out if Israel are breaking humanitarian law because they're not replying to our emails. And two, um, there are some, you know, wackos in the Conservative Party who whatever happens are going to be 100% with Israel um, and Rishi Sunak is is too weak to, to cross them. Um, which seems more plausible? What's your reaction to either of them? I mean, it could be both. We, we spoke on this show a few times about how, you know, there's 73, of, what just over, Labour have just over 200 MPs now, right? 73 Labour MPs are, are, are Labour friends of Israel. I think Conservative friends of Israel, I think, is something like 70, 75% of the party. Uh, so if you're looking at, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, story later on uh, in regards to Alan Duncan on the show, if you're looking at, you know, effectively a takeover um, of, of, a, of a party of government, with regards to a certain political position, which is obviously favoring Israel, um, by a certain lobby group, Conservative Friends of Israel. I mean, there are a few examples which are more impressive than that. I can't think of any special interest group, whether it's maybe business, I suppose, with the with the Conservatives. But, you know, 70% of Labour MPs aren't that amenable to trade unions. You know, so it's going to be very hard for the Tories to have a clear, fair, objective line on this. And I think Kearns, what she's saying, she's saying because of her role on a select committee, it's going to be very, very hard. And I mean, it really does back up the argument that we, we don't have a government. You know, I've said this repeatedly. We do not, this country does not have a government. Go outside, look at all the stuff that's going wrong. We don't have a government. But it's also true with regards to foreign policy. Either we outsource what we're doing to the Americans, look at the Red Sea. The Americans are doing something, oh, okay, let's just join them. Or something like this, where frankly you have special interests just running circles around um, both party leaders, frankly. But I mean, this is more of a concern with regards to the Tories, because of course the Prime Minister is a Conservative, Rishi Sunak. So uh, yeah, I, I do think it's a bit of both, and it's utterly extraordinary. You know, the collapse of UK foreign policy. Michael, Israel wouldn't even exist without the British Empire endorsing its founding, really from the Balfour Declaration after 1917 all the way through to the mid-1940s, wouldn't exist without Britain, with its extraordinary foreign and commonwealth office apparatus, its you know imperial might, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward to 2024, Suella Braverman, a backbencher, a nobody, is freewheeling this country's foreign policy in Israel while talking to senior 
Israeli figures and politicians. On the behalf of who? I don't know. What, the people of Farum? That's her constituency? Because she has no formal role with regards to the foreign policy of our government. Um, it, it really does, like I say, underscore the extent to which nobody is in charge of the Conservative Party and nobody is in charge of the country. I mean, good luck going to the electorate after Israel's killed three British nationals and saying, oh yeah, we've changed our prime minister again for what, the third time in four years? And no, you don't get to vote on them in a general election. Um, we're going to change them unilaterally because they didn't say the right thing about a country after it killed three of our people. Can you imagine? I mean, wow, that is crazy. Can you imagine a more out of touch reason to remove your prime minister and yet, apparently, if you listen to the media class, if you listen to several thousand people in central London, these are the serious political figures of our country. We'll have three prime ministers in four years, one of whom will choose because they didn't do the right thing when a foreign country killed three British nationals. I'm not making this up. This is what's actually happening. According to Bloomberg News, there are three cabinet ministers who are standing in the way of Sunak and David Cameron taking tougher action when it comes to Israel and stopping arms sales to Israel. Um, but the newspaper or the website didn't state who those MPs are. However, for clues, um, we could look to former Tory minister Alan Duncan. He gave some potential ideas, some hints in his LBC interview on Thursday. The Conservative Friends of Israel has been doing the bidding of Netanyahu bypassing all proper processes of government to uh, exercise undue influence at the top of government. So what you have is a lot of people now sitting around Rishi Sunak who are giving him appalling advice. Uh, let's start with the head of um, uh, CFI, or has been for many years, Lord Pollack. In my view, I think he should be removed from the Lords because he is exercising uh, the interests of another country, not that of the parliament in which he sits. Joined, I have to say, by Lord Pickles, they're the sort of Laurel and Hardy who should be pushed out together. But at the top, I mean, slightly improved by the removal of Robert Jenrick and Suella Braverman, although even today, she is still supporting Israel and the bombing and the annihilation of people in Gaza. And she does not believe that settlements are wrong. Nor, I suspect, do Michael Gove, uh, Oliver Dowden, and uh, Pretty Patel, by the way, should be reinvestigated for her visit. We still don't know who paid for her trip when she came back and tried to change government policy as a result of going on a secret trip without actually telling her officials or even the local ambassador. And if you pick up Wikipedia and you read the entry for Tom Tugendhat, who is our security minister, it says, and I'll read it out, he condemned the United Nations Security Council for its official criticism of Israel's building settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, that may have been some years ago, but he's never removed that. He's never changed his view. How can you have a security minister in the British government who does not believe in international law when all this is going on? I think he should be sacked. So Alan Duncan there named two current cabinet ministers, Oliver Dowden and Michael Gove, and one current minister, Tom Tugendhat, who he believes are advocating for Israel inside the government. So it could be those three um, who are sort of really lobbying Sunak and David Cameron to continue sending weapons to Israel. Um, but I, you know, I, I found that a very reasonable intervention by Alan Duncan, but it has found him under, or it's got him, um, put under investigation by the Conservative Party. And it's for alleged anti-Semitism. So that suspension was backed by the Board of Deputies who released this statement. The comments by Sir Alan Duncan effectively accused two Conservative peers, one of whom is Jewish, of dual loyalties. This is disgraceful. We understand the Conservatives have opened an investigation into Sir Alan's conduct, and we believe the party should consider whether his position as a party member is tenable. So that was the two peers he was talking about, Lord Pollock and Lord Pickles, both very high up in Conservative Friends of Israel. Aaron, sort of this idea, is it, even this sentence, one of whom is Jewish, of dual loyalty, so therefore it's anti-Semitic. If one of them isn't Jewish, just, yeah. it's, it doesn't seem like it is about them being Jewish, right? It's about the fact that they lobby for Israel, right? Oh, they said this about two, two people. One of them's Jewish, which means this could be anti-Semitic. Like, they both lobby for the Conservative Friends of Israel very openly, and that's why he says they shouldn't, you know, be so close to the Prime Minister. But yeah, under investigation. Do you think they'll suspend him? 
I think of course they will. Look, Michael, like, like I said, 70% of Tory MPs are in Conservative Friends of Israel. He, obviously what he said is factually true. He named a bunch of people, most of which aren't Jewish, and he didn't mention the word Jew, Jewish Judaism once. You know, he's talking about a foreign power having a completely inexplicable, unacceptable amount of influence with regards to UK foreign policy. And that's right. Politicians in this country should be making foreign policy on the best interests of the people in this country, not people elsewhere. You know, we've talked about Labour friends of Israel, Conservative friends of Israel. How about Conservative friends, their bloody constituents? It would make it. It would make a change, wouldn't it? Or Conservative friends of the three British people who were just killed by the IDF. Oh no, we can't do that. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. If you say that somebody has dual nation, um, dual, if you say that somebody has dual interests or dual loyalties, purely because they have heritage from another country. That's racist. That's unacceptable. I agree. But Michael, if I'm, I'm half Iranian. If you said, I'm loyal to Tehran purely because my dad's Iranian, that would be racist. Of course it would. But if I had set up an organization called Labor Friends of Iran, and I had repeatedly visited Tehran, and I said how wonderful Iran was, and I had clear connections and contacts across Iranian business and government, and I spent money on people to change policy outcomes, to influence, to change opinions and perceptions amongst the British political class with regards to Iran, I would be a lobbyist. And then you could say, well, who is this person loyal to? Th that would be legitimate. And, it, it, and by the way, if Iran then killed three UK um, humanitarian aid personnel, former service personnel, if Iran killed them, and I said, oh, no biggie, carry on selling weapons, it would be entirely justified to say, who the hell does this guy work for? Is he British or is he Iranian? Of course, you can be both in terms of your heritage, your cultural affiliation, you know, your meaning, your family. Of course, you can. But if you, if you want to play a prominent role in public life in this country and, and be involved in politics, which, of course, all these people do, then that's a very important question. And of course, this has been raised by the fact that the literal director, former director of Labour Friends of Israel, the literal director, who, as I've said, is in a game or was in the game of trying to impact policy outcomes in this country by lobbying political figures within Labour with regards to Israel, closing the name, Labour Friends of Israel, the literal director of that organization is now a spokesperson for the Israeli government. Imagine if you said about him 10 years ago, well, who's, who, who, who does this guy serve, the UK or Israel? Oh my God, anti-Semite. He's the literal spokesperson for the Israeli government. It's crazy. So what, you can now only, you can now only criticize people lobbying for Israel if they're not Jewish. So if I do it, you can criticize me. You can say, this is not acceptable. But then if then a Jewish person does it, a person of Jewish heritage, that's, that you can't do that. By the way, my, granda, uh, my, my grandmother's Jewish, my father's Jewish. So maybe, do I get a get out of jail card? It's so stupid, so moronic. Anybody with a brain cell knows this. If you're lobbying for another country and its interests, people are going to call you a lobbyist. You can also have an argument about whether or not that's legitimate, right? You might you might say it's perfectly fine for to, to have a bunch of people in politics who are open about the fact that they are sort of partial towards one government, one country, one business, whatever. But that has to be very open and it has to be under a lot of scrutiny. And then if any particular sort of lobby group seems to be having a bit too much sway in a policy sphere, then yeah, that probably is a problem, right? Um, Alan Duncan has a long history of... Um, talking about this as well. Um, he's long been a target of Israel. Um, in 2017, Al Jazeera managed to secretly record an Israeli spy encouraging a senior civil servant to take him down. Can I give you some happy that and suggest you take down? <laughs> well, you know, if you look hard enough, I'm sure that there is something that we're trying to find. Yeah, I have some of these. Let's talk about it. Okay. No, she knows we can't be the one the question. Yeah, it's good to remind me. <laughs> so the Deputy Foreign Minister Shai Massot was referring to was... Alan Duncan. He was at that time Minister of State for Europe and the Americas. Um, and in fact, he only had that role because a year earlier, he had been due to be appointed to the Middle East post. But again, Israel's lobbyists got in his way. Now, this is a passage from his published diary. Really interesting, um, Alan Duncan's diaries should really have had a bit more political impact than they did. Um, so this is from his diaries. They were released in 2021 as a book. Um, this is his his um, note um, 
from the 16th of July, 2016. At 5.30pm, I go to the Foreign Office. All seems clear and agreed that I will be the Minister for the Middle East as expected. Permanent Undersecretary Simon MacDonald called to say it's all been agreed and he would recommend it to the Foreign Secretary. But when I see Boris Johnson, who's then the Foreign Secretary, at 6pm, it seems a massive problem has arisen, which is nothing short of contemptible. Boris says the Conservative Friends of Israel are going ballistic, and Eric Pickles and Stuart Pollack have both called him incessantly saying, I must not be appointed. This had started despite my appointment not having yet been announced. Now, number 10 are telling Boris, I cannot have the Middle East. Right, so he was supposed to be given the post of um, you know, Middle East minister, minister for the Middle East. Um, but two people um, from the Conservative Friends of Israel have been lobbying really hard, and now he's been put in a different post. I mean, a different post. He's probably a bit less expert, has less expertise on, right? This is a guy who knows a lot about the Middle East. The following day, um, Alan Duncan wrote in his diary how the campaign against him getting that Middle East post had been a cross-party affair. So 17th of July, 2016. The Board of Deputies of British Jews have had an open webcast with their chairman, Jonathan Arkush, in which Labour MP Louise Elman says, I must not be an FCO minister, so a Foreign and Commonwealth Office minister. My appointment isn't even public yet. How did they know? Clearly Pickles and Pollack have been actively lobbying against me, linking Conservative Friends of Israel, Labour Friends of Israel and the Board of Deputies. This is the most disgusting interference in our public life. I find it astonishing the system allows it to happen. All the more so as anything I have ever said has been wholly in tune with government policy. The difference seems to be that I believe in that policy, whereas CFI and the government itself do not. Now, that final couple of sentences is really key. Um, and this is what he's sort of been saying in the media sort of ever since, which is to say, if people were lobbying to say you can't put Alan Duncan in that position because he has a sort of commitment which is counter to government policy, that might be somewhat reasonable. But Alan Duncan is clear, and I think you, you you can see this from all the statements he's made, that what separates him from the people, Conservative Friends of Israel like, is that he actually consistently supports British government policy on Israel. Now, you probably don't think, I mean, I don't think British government policy on Israel is, is perfect, but it is is better than what CFI wants, which is to say these settlements in the West Bank have to stop, right? So Alan Duncan talks all about settlements. He's saying he supports the government policy that these settlements have to stop and conservative friends of Israel don't. And it's because he was, you know, forthright about stopping these settlements that he wasn't allowed to have this job. He says he was too committed to government policy. And so he had to get put in a different role. You saw there, he described the campaign as disgusting interference. As we've said, it was successful, right? It was successful. He got put in a different post. And after the Al Jazeera revelations, um, Duncan wrote another diary entry, which confirmed you know, he, he, he'd always known um, the power of the Israel lobby um, inside the British um, government, inside the Foreign Office. Um, so this is the moment he briefed the then top civil servant at the Foreign Office about the plotting by Shimas or him sort of recounting it. So he says, I call Permanent Secretary for the Foreign Office, Simon MacDonald, and brief him similarly. I teasingly remind him of what happened and what I said to him on my first day as a minister. Simon, didn't I tell you the CFI and the Israelis think they control the foreign office? And they do. So that's what he's saying there. Now, we, you know, I, I don't think the Israelis control the foreign office. Um, I think they have a lot of influence in the foreign office. Now, we've talked about this a lot. Do we just support Israel because there are some powerful lobbyists who want us to support Israel? No. Um, Britain has supported Israel for, for a long time, and the West has in general, um, because Israel sort of has been a barrier, a block. Um, to, I mean, especially sort of in the, the, the early second half of the 20th century, Arab socialism. So the Americans especially, and we were as well, think of the Suez Canal, we were very much opposed to sort of Nasser, um, Arab socialism and the idea of Arab unity. Having Israel there as a bit of a spoiler country was very, very helpful. But I do think that when it comes to settlements, for example, and when it comes for the killing of UK citizens in aid convoys, that it does seem to be the case that the Israel lobby does have significant influence over what the government says and, and, and does. Aaron, Alan Duncan's diaries were published in 2021. Now, the claims here, they seem quite explosive, right? 
But I don't think I saw them reported anywhere other than Declassified UK. Declassified UK, great website, you should check it out. Um, but they sort of covered this in detail. I didn't see it in any of the other newspapers. And this seems like, it, you know, this should have been quite blockbuster, I would have thought. Well, Michael, you have to remember that mo most journalists, political journalists in this country are incurious and institutionally stupid. Uh, obviously, there's a vested interest amongst the Conservative Party. Most of them are members of CFI, to not talk about it. And of course, this was immediately following the Corbyn leadership. So if, if you, even if you're on the centre-left, um, you weren't a Corbynista. You don't want to talk about Israel and their influence in UK policymaking. I think it's very important to say, you know, we do not, they do not control the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Foreign Office. They, they don't. Okay. The point is, CFI had enough leverage to make life difficult for Boris Johnson or the Prime Minister at the time. Boris Johnson, I think, was Foreign Secretary. They had enough leverage to make life difficult for those individuals that they didn't bother. But ultimately, the buck still st stops with elected politicians on this stuff. There might be an overhead for them. They might lose allies. But it, it does. They don't control the Foreign Office. And like you say, support for Israel or, or for the idea of the state of Israel, a homeland for Jewish people prior to the formation of the state of Israel in the, in the mid to late 1940s, was championed by British politicians all the way after really Lloyd George, precisely because, as you said, it was viewed as a, as a bulwark against the East. Theodore Herzl, who was the godfather of Zionism, when he spoke to British political figures in this country, even before that, was quite clear that we we want to be effectively an outpost for your interests overseas, particularly British interests overseas. So the British in particular, right from the moment that, of course, Palestine was no longer part of the Ottoman Empire because the Ottomans lost the First World War, they were on the losing side, the Allies won, the Brits got the mandate of Palestine. Right from that moment, they viewed this part of the world as, as A, strategically important because of, like you say, the Suez Canal, um, and the idea that it could be taken or closed down from the north through Sinai, uh, but also uh, religious reasons as well. Um, you had, for instance, evangelicals, Christian Zionists, who, who believed in the idea of Jewish people returning to, you know, uh, the Holy Land. So there's a bunch of reasons why historically there's been support for Israel, the idea of Israel, Israeli foreign policy amongst British politicians. It's not simply, you know, the perfidious lobbying efforts of, of the Israel lobby, although that's a huge variable. And actually, I think it's probably never been stronger. Uh, but yeah, that's not the only reason why. That point about it's never been stronger. I mean, in a way, I don't, we, we don't know. I suppose, I think Britain's support for Israel, sort of its, its seeming unconditional support for them has never been less rational, let's say from the sort of perspective of, of, of the UK government. Because, you know, there were plenty of times in the 20th century where it did make a lot of sense for, for Britain to support Israel. Um, it probably still does make sense for Britain to support the existence of Israel. But for Britain to unconditionally be supporting everything that Israel is doing right now, you know, when Israel is very proactively um, acting against the explicit preferences of the UK government. The UK government say they want the two-state solution. Um, Israel is explicitly saying they don't. Right. The UK government is saying, don't expand settlements. The Israelis are expanding settlements and sort of giving free reign to their settlers to kick Palestinians out of their homes. Right. The, the UK government is saying, we really don't want the, the Palestinians to be pushed out of Gaza because it will create regional instability. The Israelis are sort of doing everything in their power to make Gaza completely unlivable. The UK government and the US government, by the way, saying we don't want this to become a sort of regional conflagration. And the Israeli government is, is just bombing foreign embassies in neighboring countries, right? So it does seem like our interests aren't aligned when it comes to these things, right? But, but yet we are still finding it very difficult as a country to say, we're not going to send you weapons anymore. And I do think that there is, you know, some degree to which a lobby is, is playing a role um, in, in stopping um, the UK government getting to that place. Alan Duncan, of course, you know, he, he, he doesn't know a lot. Right? He, he's been in those top jobs, in those top roles. So I would take what he's saying pretty seriously. Armin Jones has been on Sky News debating Israeli influencer Hen Mazik. Here was an interesting moment. I do understand why this conflict raises a lot of emotions. I think we need to focus on reality. Uh, and I understand, especially when you are Jewish or Palestinian or Arab, why you feel so, so connected to this conflict uh, and, and really being hurt and upset. I'm upset. My family, my friends, I lost friends in October 7th. Um, I don't understand why you are so... Uh, because I object to genocide. That, because I'm a human being. Uh, and of course it's not a genocide. Because I'm a human being, that's why. 
I don't see why you care is a really, really poor argument to make on television, especially when you're talking about, you know, a war where, in which 30,000 people have been killed. Now, call it a genocide, call it a genocide, a war, just say it's a war. I mean, the argument you shouldn't care, this isn't a big deal, is a poor one, right? Very, very weak argument. I have to say, sometimes where I'm more sympathetic to an argument of that style is when it comes to specific end states, one state, two states. I'm sort of like, I as sort of like a, a British person with no real involvement in that, I do think that's, leave that up to the people there to work out. I don't have a strong position on, when it comes to end states, but I do have a very strong position when it comes to the systematic killing of civilians and the starvation of, of, of 2 million people, right? That's something where I don't think you need to have a connection to have really strong opinions. Um, let's go back to that um, debate though, because this is the moment which has really caused some controversy. You're right, Britain doesn't supply that many arms, but if it ends arms sales, that then puts huge pressure on Germany, which has decided to make the Palestinian people pay for the grievous crimes it committed by oh, attempting to exterminate on, the, Germ uh, the Jewish people. Come on, have some distance. Um, and and, and the second and no, the second I won't point, let you, well, the, the, the and, and the, the, the other Holocaust will not be used okay. this way. How dare you? You're it not shouldn't Jewish. Be used. Don't do that. It shouldn't really, be used. Really, don't do it. This it shouldn't be used to force the Palestinians. Even for you, it's a red line. It shouldn't be used to force the Palestinians. Let's be clear. You are. Now, in terms of, I think Hen believes that you are that you are. Disparaging the memory of the Holocaust. Of course, because you just did. No, I didn't. You I said, said Germany is making Palestinians I said Germany. Play, pay yes. for the six yes, million Jews that were killed yes, in the Holocaust. Yes, I did. Yes, I This is absolutely disgusting. I can't believe no, you. you're wrong. You, I, you, I stand by what I said because it's absolutely true. Um, I was are you saying that wow. Germany is supporting Israel because of what happened? Yes, in it's, the it believes it can rather make, than it, punishing it, it, it the believes, Palestinians. It believes Germany. Germany has decided it can make up for its obscene guilt by forcing it's somebody else guilt. to pay for the crimes that Germany committed. Yeah, it's a very straightforward wow. point. There's nothing offensive about it. It's a of, very Of course point. it's offensive. I'm telling no, you it's no, offensive in, and I'm a Jewish in, in Israeli. Terms of, in terms of, in terms of, our, in terms of answers. You will not take it back. No, I, I Because okay. you don't care about Jews. Because Do you, you don't care about You know what's interesting? Okay. I that exchange has seen lots of people hand-wringing about Owen Jones mentioning the Holocaust, which apparently no one is allowed to do. Um, but what he said is uncontroversially true, right? On October the 12th, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said this... Our own history, our responsibility deriving from the Holocaust makes it our permanent duty to stand up for the existence and security of the state of Israel. This responsibility guides us. Right? Since then, Germany has banned multiple protests in solidarity with Gaza. Its institutions have deplatformed various artists who've expressed solidarity with Palestinians, many of them Jewish, in fact. And the ridiculousness of their position peaked with this moment when the German culture minister was forced to clarify at a film festival, that she had only clapped for an Israeli filmmaker, not his Palestinian co-director. Aaron, this is a pretty... I mean, this keeps happening, right? Someone goes on television and makes a really you know, normal point, and then Twitter has just gone wild, saying, oh, my God, Owen Jones should never be invited back on television again. Again. Uh, what, what do you make of it? Owen Jones is cancelled again. <laughs> Look, Michael, saying, I, saying I'm offended isn't an argument. I'm offended. How dare you? How could you? I don't care. I don't care how offended you are. Like you say, Owen is right. Those are the facts. That's the point of journalism. You've literally shown a quote from Olaf Scholz said within a week of the October 7th massacres, which weren't massacres, it was a war crime. Um, it was murder. As Owen at the time overtly said, making clear precisely what Owen is trying to say that of, of course, of course, of course, there is a connection between Germany's historical support for the state of Israel, arms sales to that country for many decades, of course, and their completely justified and understandable guilt about the largest mass murder in European history. Of course, those two things are connected. And I saw the response to this, and I'm just thinking, wow, these people have just created an alternative reality for themselves. Of, of course, they're like, Holocaust commemoration is now, and of course it should be, is, is central to the idea of post-war German citizenship. It's central to the idea of post-war German like nationhood. And, and now we're going to pretend that isn't a thing. And if you do say that on TV, then you're going to be cancelled. And this is really key, Michael. I, I was defending Alan Duncan on Twitter, I think yesterday or the day before. And then Ben Kentish, who's a British Jewish journalist, I think he has a show on LBC. He doesn't have anything original or interesting to say, but I, I presume that's why he's got a show on LBC. He, was, he quote tweeted me, and said, oh, look, you know, the people that minimized anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, even though I was literally on BBC 
alongside Lord Winston and Michael Portillo saying that the mural was anti-Semitic, had anti-Semitic tropes. That counts for nothing, of course. He quote tweeted me and saying, you know, apparently the people who were anti-Semitic in Labour are now making excuses for Alan Duncan. He couldn't actually rebut my argument, which is you're talking about this being anti-Semitic when the man, Alan Duncan, hasn't mentioned the word Jewish, Judaism, Jews. He's criticizing actually people who, for the most part, are not Jewish. Um, but he couldn't rebut that. So, of course, he had to say, commentator Aaron Bastani, racist. And then you see it with Owen Jones. People can't rebut the point. So they have to say, I'm offended. You shouldn't be allowed back on here. This is awful. This is disgraceful. You're evil incarnate. Look, for the most part, Michael, the average punter has zero time for this. And I think what's interesting is that lots of pro-Israel people, because of the way that Twitter works now, it's almost like they're the radical left on Twitter from 10 years ago. Because they see their points of view being you know, echoed back to them on a social media platform, frankly, which very few people actually use, they think, oh yeah, everyone agrees with me. No, most people with half a brain cell know that Germany has the attitude it does towards Israel, the support it has for Israel because of its history. I mean, most people with a brain cell know that. And most people, and this is something I love actually about this country, I have to say, most people don't buy the whole uh, I want to cancel you. I'm not going to make a counter argument. You're just a bad person. You're evil. You shouldn't have the right to make your points anymore. People don't like that. They don't like it. And actually, it's a really clear, distinctive line in terms of the political debate in this country compared to somewhere like Germany. In Germany, actually, foreclosing spaces to criticize Israel has just been shocking to me. You know, German civil society, I think, has collectively lost its mind. I think that's partly not possible in the UK because there is at least still some remnant of the belief in opposing points of view, the right to freedom of speech, a belief that actually people should be able to say what they think, even if you don't agree with them. So yeah, it's the exact same argument they make around the protests, right? Oh, we have to ban these protests, even though of course, you know, the vast majority of these people on, uh, the vast majority of people on these protests are very good people, law abiding people, decent people, families, etc. They just oppose genocide. They just oppose 13,000 children being killed. They just oppose war crimes and uh, collective punishment against civilians. You know, they just oppose, as we, we heard earlier on with Alicia Kearns, the idea that you know, Israel now has carte blanche to blow up diplomatic consulates and embassies around the, around the world and break international law and international convention. That's what they oppose. But of course, no sensible person thinks you should be able to starve kids, blow up consulates, kill aid workers. No sensible person is going to say that. I think this is good. So what they have to do instead is libel, defame, slander the people making those arguments. That's the only route they've got available to them. And my worry is this, Michael. As this gets worse, and it will get worse, it will get worse, Israel has lost an ounce of credibility with the world and its wife on this issue now. It's gone. It is absolutely gone. When I mean, you've got the former head of MI6 saying that we should suspend weapon sales to Israel or vice chair of Rusi, it's finished, frankly, in terms of the debate in this country. And as it gets worse and more obvious that they are increasingly out of touch with global opinion on this, the kinds of arguments and smearing you've seen against Owen Jones in the last 24 hours, that will become even worse. And actually, our here at Navarra Media, we should get ready for that. Because, like I say, nobody is willing to defend killing children, killing humanitarian aid workers, collective punishment, ethnic cleansing, war crimes. Nobody's willing to defend that. So it's going to get worse and worse and worse in terms of the character assassinations on people like Owen, by the way, who've been right all along. Hen Mazig, the guy he was up against, tweeted, There's nothing obscene about Germany holding itself accountable for murdering 6 million Jews. Germany, like the US, is Israel's ally because these countries face shared threats. Revising the history of the aftermath of the Holocaust to delegitimize Israel is Holocaust distortion. It's really insane to call Holocaust distortion. Right? So Owen was, was, quite, he was making a very simple point, which is to say that in Germany, it's very difficult to criticize anything that Israel does um, because of the guilt they feel over the Holocaust. Now, you know, it's not, insa it's not insane that Germany has a, has a particular relationship to Israel, right? That's not insane, right? We, 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 it's completely understandable how a, how a nation that committed such a grave crime feels particularly, you know, sensitive in terms of its relationships with, with, with the world's only Jewish state, right? But it's also so, so fundamentally legitimate to say the way that Germany is now handling its relationship with Israel is deeply problematic, especially when it leads to, 
you know, the targeting of shed loads. I mean, it's mainly Muslims, I think, who are being targeted in, in Germany, but also lots of Jewish people. Anyone who says anything remotely sensible about Israel is now, you know, completely isolated or marginalized from, from mainstream political discourse. That's such a reasonable thing to say. And then if you say that, you get accused of Holocaust distortion. Throwing around big words with not much care, Aaron. Um, I suppose my, my final question to you, I do think it's undeniable that it was the left really that started this. So sort of saying someone said something on TV that I'm not in favor of. Um, and I'm going to sort of try and make a bit of a Twitter storm to get producers to feel worried about inviting them back on. You know, some people might disagree. I think probably the left has, you know, more responsibility for that than anyone else. I do think, though, it has sort of shifted to the center um, and that maybe people on the left are getting a bit more relaxed about policing what people are saying, a bit more sort of understanding actually the, 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 the importance of freedom of speech. And it's actually sort of people, especially in the center, who seem to be most paranoid about who is and who isn't allowed to say stuff. Do you think there's any any truth to that or have I just sort of changed who I'm following? I mean, on, on Twitter, what do you think? Yeah, e Elon changed the algorithm, Michael, and you've been hoodwinked. No, I think there's absolutely something to that. And I wouldn't say the left started this. I think they've certainly normalized it in a world of social media. Uh, but if you look at Zionist lobbying efforts, you know, BICOM in this country, APAC in the US, uh, this idea of, and it's, it's talked about by Nick Davies, um, Flat Earth um, Journalism, uh, flat Earth News, rather, I think. This old book now, look, I, 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 but I can remember the chapter in particular. It's an astonishing piece of journalism where he talks about, and I've talked about this on the show many times, the barbed wire approach with regards to public relations and Israel. So if, you know, um, the Today program covers a story in a certain way, let's get a thousand people to send emails in complaining. Um, and that, look, that's not going to get anybody fired or suspended. What it does is it puts a seed in the producer's mind Look, anything that's remotely contentious that relates to Israel, I don't want to cover it because it's just too much headache, too much friction. So that's the barbed wire approach to PR. That's really been developed by Zionist lobby in, in the US and the UK over many, many decades. I think you're right. In terms of social media, it became the norm. It became a habit through people who viewed themselves as progressive, often, by the way, against other progressives. You know, I don't know how many boycotts Navarro has been subject to over the years, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. The, the experience of the last year, particularly post-Gaza, post-October 7th, I think if that doesn't impress the importance of freedom of association, freedom of protest, freedom of speech to everyone on the left, then I don't know what will, right? Sometimes the minority are, is right about something and they should be able to express their opinions on it. And that's how actually history moves forward. And that's a Marxist idea. That's a left-wing idea. That dissent is, is, is one of the catalysts for progress. If you prohibit dissent, you're gonna you're gonna stunt progress. So, I hope it's a change. I, I personally think something has shifted. I actually think in many ways now. I look at the right online, and they remind me of the left ten years ago. Uh, well, hopefully that means something positive because the left over the last ten years hasn't really gone many places good. But yes, they're they're very much uh, adopting many of the worst aspects of of sort of left wing identity politics over the last ten years. By the way, including on this subject, you know, some of the people who would say that I don't believe in identity politics, it's all awful. If I say to a, a British Jewish person, I disagree with your views on anti-Zionism, you're saying anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, I disagree. One of those people would say, how dare you tell a Jewish people? They get to define their own oppression, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'd say, well, there's also objective facts, right? There's a history of British Jews in this country going back 100 years who oppose Zionism. There was a Rothschild that opposed Zionism. Um, uh, Edwin uh, Montague, he was, a, he was a member of, I think, Lord George's cabinet. He was the minister in charge of munitions in the First World War, British Jew, practicing Jew, um, unlike Disraeli. You know, he, he was an anti-Zionist. So actually, I think that's a really dopey, stupid thing to say. There are also this, these, these, uh, these rather annoying things uh, called, you know, objective facts. But the exact same person who would say that, oh, you know, this minority identity politics is all nonsense. The minute it comes to uh, somebody saying anti-Zionism uh, anti equates to anti-Semitism, oh, well, they get to define that stuff. Huh? I thought you opposed that uh, sort of worldview, standpoint sort of anti-racism, right? It all depends upon what X person says. Objective facts don't matter. What you think doesn't matter. Though That's what you've been criticizing the left on. But actually, when it's somebody you agree on, when it relates to a country, Israel, which you view as a bulwark against, let's be honest, Muslims, 
all of a sudden you change 180 degrees. How convenient. That's a good note to end the show on. Thank you, Aaron, for joining me tonight. My pleasure as always, Michael. Have a good weekend. I should say thank you, my dear, for joining me tonight. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure to come back on Monday for another stream. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.